Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The Biophysical Properties of Skeletal Muscle Part 1. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about the length tension relationship of skeletal muscle, load velocity relationship, motor units, concept of muscle twitch and the frequency tension relationship in a skeletal muscle fiber. The skeletal muscles respond to a stimulus, either it can be a chemical stimulus or a mechanical stimulus or a thermal stimulus. The skeletal muscles are excitable, they can contract they are extend, they have the property of extensibility as well as elasticity. Excitability implies that the uh, skeletal muscles can generate its own action potential. Of course, the skeletal muscles are stimulated by the neurons through the neuromuscular junction. The release of neurotransmitters acting on the skeletal muscle membrane to generate its own action potential. So, this action potential which is generated makes the skeletal muscle fiber to contract by means of the actin myosin interaction and development of a power stroke. And this skeletal muscles are also extensible that is they respond to the stretch uh, and these are they are extensible as well as they, uh, they can regain back to its original length because of its elasticity properties and these are mainly due to the presence of other uh, proteins other than the actin and myosin especially the titan along with the presence of other viscous elastic properties of the skeletal muscle which makes them extensible as well as elastic in nature. So, other than the basic properties of skeletal muscle fibers, uh, by looking at the sarcomere which is the basic structural and functional unit of a skeletal muscle fiber. So, this sarcomere is nothing but where uh, the space between the two Z disc in between we have the actin and myosin filaments which are overlapped with each other. So, the space where the myosin filaments the thick filaments are alone present is called as the A band and the actin filaments are attached to the Z disc on the sides and uh, the uh, actin filaments will slide over the myosin filaments that is only the actin filaments move over the cross bridges of the myosin heads the myosin filaments stay in between the same. So, when we consider the uh, length tension relationship of a single skeletal muscle fiber to plot the length of the sarcomere and the tension which is de developed in the sarcomere, the ideal length or the optimal length at which the skeletal muscle fiber can exert its maximum tension is between 2 to 2.25 micrometers of the sarcomere length. So, at this length the tension which is developed by the skeletal muscle fiber is maximum that is at this length of the sarcomere the actin and myosin overlap is nominal or ideal for the skeletal muscle to generate its maximum tension. So, when the uh, length of the sarcomere decreases to about 1.65 micrometers, here uh, there is um, little uh, moving of the actin filaments towards the myosin cross bridges towards the M line, thereby little more uh, overlap of the actin filament itself leading to less development or less interaction of actin and myosin and decrease in the tension of the muscle. If the uh, sarcomere length is too shortened or it is too lengthened also, the tension which is developed in the sarcomere in the skeletal muscle fiber goes almost towards 0. So, when the muscle is too shortened, uh, the uh, actin filaments and the Z disc overlap and they move very much closer to the M line. So, they become crumpled to each other. Also, when the uh, sarcomeres is too lengthened, the actin uh, will move towards the Z line and the myosin, actin myosin interaction for it to happen, they do not overlap each other and the overlap is very, very minimal thereby leading on to. So, even when at such a length, if the skeletal muscle fiber is being stimulated, it can lead to development of almost zero tension in the skeletal muscle fiber. When uh, this picture is going to demonstrate, so at an optimal length when the filaments overlap is optimal, there is going to be maximum interaction and maximum sliding of uh, uh, actin filaments over the myosin filaments and development of maximum tension. So, when the 
actin filaments are very much away. We can see how uh, how much away there is no active cross bridge interaction which can happen. So, the tension which is uh, developed is going to be very much minimal in case of a longer length of the sarcomere. When the sarcomere length is too short, when the actin filaments are already moved towards the myosin filaments. So, the actin myosin interactions again reduce and when such a uh, skeletal muscle fiber is stimulated, it can lead to crumpling of the uh, overlap of the actin and myosin filaments thereby leading to reduced tension in such a stimulation. Now, when we consider the whole muscle and plot the length of the muscle fiber against the tension of the muscle fiber, when the muscle is suspended against a constant load, uh, the isometric tension which can be recorded in such a cases at different loads, if it is plotted against a graph. So, when the muscle is not stimulated by a stimulator in an unstimulated mode, when the muscle is stretched by a load, at this length still some amount of tension is being developed in the skeletal muscle fiber, which is called as the passive tension. So, in case of passive tension here, the actin myosin interaction is not happening and the tension which is developed in the skeletal muscle fiber is predominantly due to the elastic properties of the titan, a protein which is uh, one end of the titan is attached to the izzard line, the other end is attached to the myosin uh, of the sarcomere. So, this titan is being stretched whenever there is a, a load which is suspending on the muscle and this elastic property leads to development of some tension in the muscle which is called as a passive tension. When the muscle is being stimulated now at different loads, there is increase in tension in the muscle and the tension which is actually developed only out of stimulation. So, the stimulation will lead to actin myosin interaction and development of the power stroke and the uh, sliding filament mechanism. So, this tension which is actually developed only out of the actin myosin interaction is called as the active tension. So, the total tension is nothing but the tension which is contributed by the elastic properties of the muscle which is passive tension added to the active tension which is developed due to the actin myosin interaction. So, the active tension can develop only when the muscle is held at the optimal length. So, the titan proteins uh, which contributes to the elastic properties of the muscle already keeps the muscle in a stretched uh, state, so that the muscle is always present in the uh, optimal length. So, when such a muscle is stimulated, always an active tension, the maximum active tension can be produced in the skeletal muscle fiber. So, the total tension is nothing but the active tension plus the passive tension developed in a skeletal muscle fiber. Now, when coming on to the load velocity relationship of a skeletal muscle fiber, that is whenever uh, a muscle is being suspended by a load, how fast the muscle uh, is able to react, how fast it contracts to act on the load, the tension uh, to generate the tension depending upon the amount of the load which is being acting on the muscle. Lighter objects can be lifted faster than heavier objects. So, we all have experienced that. So, similarly, when there is a less load, suppose if I have to just lift a chalk piece, okay, when there is a less load, there is very less tension which is going to be developed in the muscle and the velocity of contraction is very fast, that is the speed of the action is going to be very fast because the lifting of chalk piece is going to be very much easier because the load is very less for which is acting on my muscles, so I can lift it very fast. So, the shortening velocity is going to be, the velocity is very high whereas the when there is almost 0 or no load acting on the muscle. As the load acting on the muscle is increasing, the velocity of shortening of the muscle will decrease. That is for instead of chalk piece, then I have to lift a remote, if I have to lift a uh, tumbler, if I have to lift a stool. So, accordingly as the load is increasing, the speed of the lifting is going to decrease depending upon the weight of the load. So, thereby when the more, more load acting on the muscle, there is more tension because I need more force to develop, but less velocity of contraction, the speed of contraction, the velocity of contraction is going to be less. Now, when the load is maximum, when the load is acting on the muscle is maximum or I am not able to move the object, I can just hold the object. So, the tension developed is maximum. In that cases, the shortening velocity is almost 0 because there is more load 
in the load and tension is maximum the object cannot be moved so in that case there is zero velocity of contraction when the load acting on the muscle is more than the tension which is developed on the muscle so this is a, a case of an isometric contraction and these are the things which are happening during isotonic contraction so this is an example of concentric isotonic contraction so when the load acting on the muscle is greater than the tension which could be developed by the muscle the muscles will go in for lengthening reaction for example if i'm going to hold a heavier object for longer time i can just hold it for some time after that i uh, i tend to drop the object so that is called so when the load acting on the muscle is more than the tension which could be developed it goes in for a lengthening reaction so very heavy load the again there is some movement which is called as the lengthening velocity so the velocity lengthening velocity increases as the load is increased and it leads to the negative work which can be done by the muscle now when the load increases more than the tension which is happening on the muscle for example very heavy object which cannot be uh, held up for longer time we try to drop it down so during this time the velocity of contraction increases of course here it is more of a lengthening reaction where the muscle is uh, unable to withstand the load and it tries to drop down by means of a lengthening reaction where the lengthening velocity of the skeletal muscle fiber will increase so this is the classical load velocity relationship of a skeletal muscle fiber so by demonstrating by uh, movement of the uh, actin and myosin filaments during the different loads so basically the atp hydrolysis atps activity myosin atps activity determines the shortening velocity of the skeletal muscle fiber so if the atps hydrolysis is faster then the uh, quicker actin myosin interaction uh, happens contraction relaxation happens and there is fast movement of the actin over myosin so this happens whenever there is a less load less load leading on to faster activation of cross bridges and the shortening velocity is higher when the load is re, uh, relatively higher and uh, more load acting on the skeletal muscle fibers now here the time uh, the atps activity in such cases will be very slower the atp hydrolysis is uh, very slower so the cross bridge cycle takes a longer time so now the actin myosin interaction also is available for a longer time so the actin has got more time to interact with the myosin so this interaction stays for a longer time leading on to slower activation of cross bridges so when the load acting on the such a skeletal muscle fiber is higher it leads to slower activation of cross bridges and slower actin myosin interaction coming to the concept of motor units so the alpha motor neurons which are arising from the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord they descend down and they synapse on the Uh, muscle at the neuromuscular junction and divides into several branches and uh, each branch of a motor neuron goes and supplies several muscle fibers so the branch of the motor neuron and the muscle fibers supplied by this particular branch together forms what is called as the motor unit and the size of the motor unit depends upon the type of the muscle for example in small muscles like extraocular muscles of eyes and the muscles of hands Uh, one single motor neuron one single branch of a motor neuron can supply up to 6 to 10 muscle fibers whereas in large muscles of the thighs and back muscles where it is mainly concerned with posture one branch of a motor neuron can supply up to 600 to 1000 muscle fibers so the size of the motor units depends upon the function of the muscle which is involved there are uh, two types of muscle fibers which are present in the skeletal muscle that slow type of fibers and fast uh, muscle fibers and the motor neuron which is supplying the skeletal muscle will always supply a similar type of muscle fiber so this though the neighboring fibers will have the other type of uh, muscle fibers uh, always there is a mixture of uh, both slow as well as fast fibers but single branch of a motor neuron will always supply if it is a slow fiber it will supply only the slow fibers and if it is a fast fiber it will supply only the fast type of muscle fibers and the recruitment of motor units like for example uh, depending upon the amount of action which is required the number of motor units which are uh, recruited for that particular action will differ in uh, smaller size of motor units if we compare this graph uh, and the strength of the muscle 
for example, in hands, uh, hand muscles and all, the number of motor units recruited, suppose if one motor unit is recruited, the strength of the muscle increases to certain extent. Suppose if the uh, action continues or if the action is uh, severe, next motor unit will be recruited and the strength of contraction will increase. So, likewise, the, as the muscle action increases, more number of motor units will be recruited, but in case of smaller motor units that is when the muscle uh, motor unit to the muscle fiber ratio is less, the strength of the muscle or the force developed in the muscle or the tension developed in the muscle does not rise to a uh, maximum extent. It is le comparatively less when compared to the larger motor units. So, here the strength developed even when one single motor unit is uh, stimulated is comparatively higher than a smaller motor unit. Similarly, when the uh, requirement of the severity of the muscle action is increased, theref thereby the second, third and fourth motor units will be increased, it will be recruited, thereby the strength of the muscle or the tension developed in the muscle is far greater in case of larger motor units muscle when compared to smaller motor units muscle. So, this is depending upon the size principle which is given by a scientist called as Honeyman. So, the motor units can be classified into basically three types, slow motor units, fast resistant to fatigue motor units and fast fatigable units. So, this slow units are initially required for uh, uh, smaller actions which are less in intensity. Then comes the uh, when the severity of action increases, next comes the fast resistant to fatigue type of motor units where uh, the more number of motor units will be recruited. Then when the fast fatigable units comes into action when the muscle action is strengthened or it is severe and accordingly it will be recruited after that the muscle will go for a fatigue. So, the neuronal action potential which is generated across the neuromuscular junction is responsible for the development of action potential in the skeletal muscle fibers. So, the action potential of a skeletal muscle fiber uh, is lasts for about 2 to 4 milliseconds and this action potential leads to the muscle twitch or the contraction in the muscle fiber. So, if we consider the duration of action potential with respect to contraction, it is uh, very large, the contractile duration is very large and this um, uh, contraction actually starts almost towards the end of the action potential only of a skeletal muscle fiber. So, this muscle twitch can be divided into three phases, the initial part is the latent period. So, even the stimulus has happened, the muscle does not contract immediately, it contracts only after some time. So, the space time between the uh, point of stimulus to the starting of contraction is called as the latent period. After that, the contraction and the relaxation happens. The time of contraction is called as contraction time and the relaxation is called as relaxation time. So, almost when uh, two third of the action potential is over, then only the contractile mechanism starts and the latent period is mainly due to the transfer of the uh, electrical potentials across the neuromuscular junction and the release of the neurotransmitters and stimulation of the receptors present in the post junctional fold uh, that is the sarcolemma of the skeletal muscle and uh, passage of this uh, action potential towards the T tubules and uh, release of calcium and uh, the calcium going and stimulating the actin uh, myosin interaction by means of troponin and tropomyosin and generation of power stroke. So, for all this contractile mechanism, the latent period is the time taken during the latent period is being consumed. Not just that, also the muscle has to overcome the viscous uh, resistance which is already existing in the muscle for it to contract. After that, the contraction and relaxation by means of the cross bridge mechanism happens in the skeletal muscle fiber. So, this skeletal muscle fibers do not have any refractory period. As long as calcium is available, as long as ATP stores are being supplied, the skeletal muscle can continue contracting. So, when there is a stimulus, the muscle goes for a twitch, it goes for a contraction. When the after the contraction is over, when there is a second stimulus, again the muscle will go for a contraction. Now, when the second stimulus is given even before the muscle can relax, the amplitude of contraction will increase. This effect is called as summation. So, when the second stimulus is given during the contraction phase itself, the amplitude of contraction will increase. When the second stimulus is given even before the contraction can start 
to the first stimulus, still the amplitude of contraction will be increased. So, this is basically when we think it is due to the accumulation of calcium in the cytoplasm. So, the calcium which is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum goes and activates a troponin C, the troponin C uncovers a tropomyosin uh, from the actin and therefore, the actin binding sites are exposed and the actin myosin interaction will happen for the cross bridge cycle to happen. Now, here uh, because there is a continuous uh, excitation, continuous stimulus being given for the relaxation to happen, the calcium has to be taken back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum via the sarco sarcoendoplasmic reticular calcium ATPase. Because this does not happen and uh, this uh, uh, amount of time is not available and before that a second stimulus is given before the relaxation uh, could happen, there is more availability of calcium now which can facilitate more of other activation of other cross pitches which are available, more of actin myosin interaction and increase in the amplitude of contraction. And when the stimulus still continues to the rate of about 5 to 10 hertz uh, uh, frequency, again we can see there is a very much increase in amplitude of contraction for every stimulus and if the stimulus frequency is still increased, there are incomplete relaxations which are happening and the amplitude of contraction keeps on increasing for still higher frequency. Those, so, this staircase phenomenon which appears like that is called as the trepi given by a scientist called as Wordwich and this is merely due to the increased availability of cytoplasmic calcium not just that also due to repeated simulation to previous contraction there is more amount of heat generated in the muscle. So, this heat which is generated will increase the enzymatic activity all the ATPase activity in the skeletal muscle and also it decreases the viscosity of the sarcoplasm that is the elastical resistance of the sarcoplasm thereby facilitating easier actin myosin interaction thereby increasing the uh, amplitude of contraction which is called as the summation. Now, when the stimulus frequency is still increased to up to 30 hertz, it leads to the development of clonus, which is uh, otherwise called as unfused tetanus, where the skeletal muscles almost goes in for a uh, continuous contraction with little incomplete relaxation in between. And when the stimulus frequency is more than about 40 hertz, it com completely goes for a fused contraction, a sustained contraction, which is called as tetanus. So, skeletal muscles can be tetanized. Even uh, the posture muscles when we are standing for longer time, they are already in a state of tetanus. They are under a state of continuous contraction to maintain the posture. That is why if this cannot continue for longer time because uh, the muscles are contracted for longer time and all the available uh, energy stores would have been utilized and after some time we tend to uh, relax and we have to take some rest. We cannot maintain that particular posture for longer time. So, this uh, fatigue mechanism happens after some period of tetanus also. So, this uh, development of uh, tetanus uh, uh, at a frequency depends upon the critical frequency of that particular muscle and this critical frequency differs from one type of muscle to another type of muscle. So, critical frequency is equal to 1 by twitch duration. For example, if a skeletal muscle uh, is having a twitch duration of about 10 milliseconds, then the critical frequency will work to about 100 per second 100 hertz. So, this particular muscle if it is stimulated less than uh, 100 hertz frequency, it will produce only as normal muscle twitch. So, if the muscle is being stimulated more than the critical frequency that is more than 100 hertz, it will go in for a summation effect. So, the critical frequency is the one which is determining the uh, summating uh, effect of a skeletal muscle and this uh, also varies from a muscle to another muscle. If the uh, stimulation frequency is really higher, it leads to uh, very high cytoplasmic calcium which is being uh, developed or accumulated in the 